a very good morning to all of you who have joined us from all over the world uh, it will be good afternoon in australia and good evening in us and canada so this is the 22nd session of our sunday webinar series that we started on the 10th of may and we have been doing it regularly every sunday so today's topic is actually very interesting we have a multi speaker panel headed by tanvi mehta who is going to give the keynote address and also moderate the session tanvi is based in singapore and she is an academic editor with over 15 years of experience so over to you tanvi um thank you vivek that was a brief and efficient introduction hi everyone i'm tanvi um we have a we are we're six of us talking today um about this topic in english which and i assume you're all interested which is why you're here um it was a, this topic came around it was a discussion that vivek and i started having um when he suggested that i speak and this was kicking around in my head and then it's sort of taken a life of its own and um well today here we are presenting presenting our views on this topic um we we i'm going to um I, i'm going to start straight away and then we will have um another five people following and um we'll have we'll save some time for question and answer session at the end so we can have discussion questions whatever needs to be done okay so i'm uh, just i'm i'm, I'm trying to be very um cognizant of the time it's a sunday so um i want to be efficient with time so let's let's get started i'll just start straight away hold on i'll share my screen okay so um today i'm talking about um indian english decolonizing the mind this is um this is my topic for today okay so just a little bit about me before we get started um i'm an academic editor i have been for the last 15 and a half years um i'm an authors editor which means that i work um directly with authors when they try to, when they try to publish in journals so i don't work with publishers um so i try to get authors to you know be their best to write their best version for publication i have a masters in english lit from bombay university and a grad dip, uh, graduate diploma in editing and publishing from macquarie university in australia um i've been exiled from india for the last 17.5 years um obviously self choice um and i'm married to a frenchy and i have two third culture kids right so third culture kids for anyone who doesn't know are kids who are living in a culture that belongs neither to to to, to neither parent right and so these kids are <laughs> juggling new realities which will never be ours um and so and the reason i mention this is because a uh, part of my search and um orientation to this topic has been uh, a result of my anxiety about how i bring my children up you know you know um think you know believing that i will never again live in india um you know what what is it of india that i transfer to them what do i pass down so these were questions that were kicking around in my mind partly and partly just being an academic editor for times who are not indian and editing for a west for western publications i think these things all kind of come together uh, created this anxiety and then that's what's propelling this topic i have also lived in different countries i've lived in india of course um and i see a typo <laughs> uh i've lived in the us and australia for 10 years and now in singapore for about 7 and a half years okay so that just something about me so you can situate where i'm coming from how is it that i'm approaching this topic okay so i think before we begin the first thing we really need to do is define what is indian english because there's uh, a lot of confusion in our minds about what this might be it took me some time to understand this as well so i thought we should this is a good place to start So instead of trying to define what it is I thought we would define by delimiting right so what it, what is it not what it's not is not english so um it's not tamilish it's not any of those other varieties that we understand and so what do i mean by english is uh, this mash up of hindi and english right uh, when we say um aajkal love something or the other you know so and we have all these uh, bollywood movie titles with um, with these words that are a mix of hindi and english so we're not talking about that right so uh, we're also not talking about 
L1 to L3 proficiency levels in English. So because English is not considered a native language in India, it is one of many that we speak uh, and one that we may not even be speaking from, from birth, we may pick it up later on. Uh, we do have varied levels of proficiency uh, in the country. So, you know, we have early, we have learners, we have people who are still struggling with the language, but we do also have people who speak it at a very high level of proficiency for professional use and are practically bilingual or native in that sense. So, so just to be very clear, it's not English and we're talking about a high level of proficiency in, in, of Indian English, right? English that's spoken in India. Okay. So um, I wanted to start a little bit with, because it's my, my topic is decolonization. So I really wanted to start with the colonial history of English in India. I think there's this idea um, that we have that English, the, you know, the reason we speak English in India is, is just, it's a byproduct of colonialism, uh, colonialism, which yes, of course it is, but it's not, it's not as simple as that. It's not just a byproduct, right? It's not something that was just transferred to us and we picked it up and hey presto, we speak it. Uh, there is a, a deep history to that. So the British in India in the 1700s to the mid 1800s, uh, English at this point is being taught by missionaries. And I think this is something important to remember because it's deeply tied in with the idea of proselytization, uh, of spreading Catholicism or well, Christianity. And um, so, you know, there's this idea that if we get people to speak English, then uh, they will see the Lord's message and will, uh, you know, understand that their lives are, they're living profane lives. Um, so, you know, there, there it's, there's this power structure already built into that, right? Um, then it's learned, it's being learned by a certain elite um, who choose to do commerce with the British. And, you know, so that's a, it's a very commercial transaction based um, event where you're learning English. At this point, people were, uh, there were universities, there was higher education, um, and people were being paid stipends to study Sanskrit and Arabic. Those were the languages that people studied in. And, um, and in fact, people had to be lured into studying English, right? They had to be paid to do that. So you can see that it was not popular. It was not it was not interesting. People were not terribly interested in studying English at this point. Um, but what happens in 1835 um, is that an act of parliament in Britain is passed. Um, this act uh, is, is quite crucial actually, because it sets, uh, it sets aside uh, one lakh rupees, which I assume at that point would have been um, a lot of money uh, for the revival and promotion of literature and, and encouragement of the learned natives of India and the introduction and promotion of a knowledge of the sciences among the inhabitants of the British territories. Okay, so it, it wants to revive and promote literature and uh, bring about a knowledge of science. Now, it doesn't say in which language. Okay? It doesn't say which language they want to promote all of this in. So along comes, um, along comes Macaulay right? Um, Thomas Babington Macaulay, he's a historian, politician, and essayist. And on the 2nd of February, 1835, before the act is passed, uh, he writes a minute, uh, a rather long minute. And, um, and point number eight, as I've put up there, you can take a second and read it. So just to highlight, um, he talks about the dialects commonly spoken among the natives that are so poor and rude. Right? Um, and then he talks about the intellectual improvement of those classes can only be done by means of some language that is uh, not vernacular amongst them. Okay, So this is a colonial project. He argues for the fact that um, the money that is being set aside by this act of parliament, this one lakh rupees, should be used to teach people in India uh, English, right? Their, their education should be done in English, English because their own native languages are so poor that um, they cannot compare to all the classics we have from Greek and Latin. Um, and, and, he, and you know, there are many other instances and passages where he, where he talks about and denigrates um, our centuries long culture and, um, and our languages and uh, very clearly puts, I don't know, at a, at a pedestal, English, England, um, and the, the Western ideologies. Okay, so once he's done that, 
right? What are the consequences of Macaulay Minute? So what happens is that the, uh, the act of parliament eventually is passed and they do decide that they will be supporting English as a medium of education in India. So support is given to uh, any institutions that are teaching English as a medium of education. There are other legislat le legislations that are passed at the same time that promote the use of English for legal and administrative purposes. So you see that there is a, a gathering, a slow gathering of the importance of English in day-to-day -day life, right? And so it becomes our language. It becomes slowly, slowly over hundred, like over you know, hundred fifty years, uh, hundred years, it becomes an Indian language. It's not just the language of the colonizers. Okay. Okay. So, what does English mean to Indians? What does it mean to us today, even? Um, well, we have to remember that uh, most people in India are, I, th I would say the majority of people in India are bilingual, if not trilingual or multilingual, right? Often English is not the first language we are learning. I know certainly for myself, I spoke nothing but Gujarati for the first five years of my life, which is my mother tongue. And learned English only after that. And then, you know, because we went to school and I went to an English medium school and that's where we learned it. And then you know, now I would say today that I'm a native English speaker. I speak it the best of all the languages I speak. But we have to remember that it's not the first language we speak, often. It is part of a large language scape. So, you know, this is the other languages that we're speaking. And what happens is that we tend to have a fairly casual relationship to English, right? Um, when you are monolingually English, uh, an English speaker, sorry, uh, like, let's say if you are a quote unquote native English speaker, if you've grown up in uh, America or the UK uh, to, you know, white American parents or black American parents, or, you know, just there's a, there is a sort of racial equality to this, uh, equivalence to this, um, or, or in the UK. Uh, you, learn, you, learn, you learn to speak English as your first language. This is the only way you learn to express yourself, right? When we don't have, when you don't have that, when English is just part of this language scape, um, we tend to use it differently. The import of the, me the, the meaning of the words uh, is not the same uh, for a monolingual speaker as it is for a bilingual or trilingual speaker. So I I'll give you this example. Recently, I had a, a, a fairly uh, uh, intense debate with a friend of mine who was American and grown up in the south, uh, southern part of America. And um, they'd come over for dinner. And, you know, I have a, a fairly uh, a foul mouth. I, I tend to curse a lot when I talk, even if it is around the kids. I know it's not a great thing, but it is what it is. And um, he kept telling me, uh, hey, stop, because his kids were there and he didn't want them affected. And we got into this really lengthy debate about um, what it meant for him if he were to curse, if his children were to curse around his parents. Um, and when, and, and he recalled an occasion when he was nine, he was 50 now, um, and it was burnt into his memory, you know, <laughs> about when he had used a four letter word and uh, the consequences that he had suffered for that. Whereas I remember very clearly uh, when I was 19 and trying to be quite cool around my mother who was, whose English is not the best. Uh, and I was trying to be cool, I think, and I said, Oh, um, so and so was. Oh, she's such a whore. Terrible thing to say. I agree, but it was uh, it was something that I was trying to do. Uh, I was trying something out, and my mom just turned around and she said, "What's that?" You know. So I hope that that clarifies that it just doesn't have the same import. We use words differently, um, and so our relationship is much more casual, right? And we can then lead to things like English and Danish and things like that. Uh, but the import of the words is very different for us. Also, English tends to be a link language for us. So between states, uh, we, uh, between the states of India, we're able to communicate through English more than sometimes in Hindi, which is supposed to be the national language, but has never been, has never achieved that status for many reasons. Um, and the, the last thing is that for, for Indians, English is a pathway to success. We all know this intuitively, but we never really say it. Um, it, it explains very well the fact that, um, you know, everybody, every parent is deaf. You know, the moment you have the, the smallest of means, you want to uh, put your child in an English medium school because you know that once they learn English, they can get, you know, have access to a bank job or a computer oriented job of some kind. So it really is the pathway to success. So in some, in some sense, in fact, English is a gateway to success. So this is what English means for us.
right? So I want to take us in a slightly different direction now um, and talk about decolonizing the mind. So what do I mean by that? First of all, um, this term kind of comes from uh, this author, and I'm not sure how to say his name, but I'll try. Um, it's in Gugi Wathiongo. He is a Kenyan uh, novelist and post-colonial theorist, right? Um, and, he, and I refer to this book of his called Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of Language in African Literature. And there are some great parallels. Uh, he talks about um, so uh, actually, it, it sort of begins for him this, this journey of questioning when he was invited to a meeting of African writers in Uganda in 1962, and he found that incredibly fantastic um, fiction writers, literature writers uh, from various African countries were not invited because they were writing in African languages. This conference was in fact only for African writers who were writing in the colonizer's language, either English or French typically at that time. Um, and what he does through this book is he looks at the effects of suppressing the native language, right? Which is in a sense what happens with Macaulay's Minute, which is when they are suppressing Arabic, they're suppressing Sanskrit and replacing it with English. Uh, it, it, it talks about the cultural violence of wiping out these native languages, because this is where, in a sense, he's suggesting we, we, we vibe the most, you know, our, 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 our true cultural selves, our true selves, in fact, uh, you know, like, because language is such an access to um, who we are uh, at our very, at our very core, at our very fundamental. So if we wipe those out and we impose the colonizer's language, you know, his, the colonizer's only intention is to, to, to suppress, to wipe out, to impose their language, and in that sense, to control our mind, to control our thinking, and in that sense, to control us, right? The, col the colonized. Um, so this is, this is kind of uh, a quote from his, his book. So he talks about how there is a, a distinct and deliberate attempt to undervalue um, the national, um, you know, all, all these aspects of our national culture. And to con there's a conscious elevation of the language of the colonizer. Now that's something I want you to just keep in mind for a minute, uh, we'll come, and because we'll come back to it. Uh, we'll come right back to it in a minute. Okay, so decolonizing in English in India. Has it happened? Have we done it? I would say yes, okay? We've had 73 years of, uh, of no colonial rule. Um, you know, English, uh, India has become a sort of a center for outsourcing of English services, uh, at least for a time. I'm not sure who else is in the game now. Um, there are, we've had countless Indian authors publishing solely in English. And of course it is the administrative, economic and legal language of India. So yes, absolutely. Have we decolonized? Yes, we've made it our own, absolutely. Uh, you know, the terms we put in there uh, refer to our own specific geographies, histories and terrain and, uh, and emotions that don't and can't exist within a British English or an American English, right? So yes, have we decolonized? Yes. But I'm suggesting that globally we're still colonized, okay? Because our usage is distinctly Indian. I want to make it clear here that it's not grammatically inaccurate, right? It, the way we speak English is not inaccurate. It's just distinctly Indian. And I think Smriti goes into some more detail about, um, about what that sounds like and gives, gives a lot of examples. Um, but the weight of our variety of English is seen as distinctly subpar, uh, at subpar, right? Because we have this idea of global English. There are many Englishes. I think we've come to acknowledge that, that there are many Englishes around the world, but yet, American English and British English continue to be seen as prestige varieties. And I have such a difficult time with that phrase, which was used by Lynn Murphy in one of her articles that she published for the Society of Copy Editors uh, in, in England, right? Um, the fact that there is a prestige variety is, is kind of takes away from the fact that actually it is the colonizer's language. It continues to be seen in this way, okay? So what I'm suggesting is that it's not that, um, the, you know, colonization continues today with Indian English, not in destruction of our native languages, but as a devaluation of our variety of English, right? Because I think it's very clear that our English is just never considered at par with the rest of, uh, well, with what is considered Native American English, uh, Native English, sorry. Um, so here we come back to that idea of the conscious elevation of the, of the colonizer, like what is, 
the colonizer is here American English, British English, probably Canadian English, Australian English, because those are seen as native English speakers and not the rest of the world, Nigerian English, let's say Philippine English, Indian English. Um, Okay, so the implications of being colonized, again, is that we see ourselves as non-native speakers. And I don't think that that is correct. Just because we've learned it, maybe not from the age of zero, but maybe from the age of five, um, doesn't, and, and, and maybe we've reached a proficiency, a level of proficiency, which is completely bilingual and, you know, or, or perfectly native. Um, we, uh, we continue to see ourselves as non-native speakers, right? Which means that we are not confident about ourselves. We're not confident about our ability in the language. Uh, and we, we constantly um, feel like we lack authority when we compare ourselves to native speakers. Right? We undervalue our English and we're constantly second guessing our usage, which I think as editors is, is kind of hits at the heart of our profession if we're constantly second guessing what it is that we can and cannot do. So um, here we are, I've talked about colonization, I've talked about decolonization, I've talked about a sort of continual global colonization. I'm proposing that in fact, what's going on is that we're in a period of, and this is quite specific to our community as editors, um, we're in a period of neo-colonization, right? Especially with outsourced English editing in India. So what do I mean by that? Um, as editors uh, who are editing for Western audiences with, we have new imperial masters. So publishers in England, in America and Canada and Australia, wherever it is, are coming to India because they are taking, they are making use of these neoliberal market forces, which um, take advantage of these, um, you know, these heavy advantages that they have uh, when it comes to the exchange rate. Um, and, uh, and come to India and say, right, okay, these guys can speak English, you know, they can, they can fix this stuff for us and we can save a buck or two. Um, so in a sense, we are now, uh, the brunt, you know, so um, we are now having to edit for them, uh, for their audiences, for American, British, Canadian, Australian audiences. We have to now go back again and learn their English, not you know, and we have to kind of find a way to suppress our own voices because um, we can't let Indian English come through in the editing, I mean, God forbid, because it's, yes, it's true. We are, we are editing for native speaker audiences. We are editing for, um, you know, readers in those markets. Um, but I'm saying we have to be aware that this is what's going on. Um, okay, so what is the implication for Indian editors? What am I suggesting? Am I suggesting that we start editing with our Indian English and we just let it fly? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, 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 I certainly don't mean to say that we should bite the hand that feeds us, right? Uh, this is our bread and butter. These are our employers. This is where we make our money. Um, so, uh, and, and we do edit for specific linguistic expectations. So I don't think we should turn around and say, hey, too bad. I speak Indian English and that's what I'm going to edit for or in uh, because that's just not, that's not an economic reality that we can really, um, you know, uh, see through. So what are we to do? What am I suggesting? Yeah, great. We're colonized, we're decolonized, we're, decolonized, we're neocolonized. Wonderful. We have all these labels, but really what can we do about this? Well, here's a great quote, right? Oops. It says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Okay, this is a really powerful quote for, uh, by uh, Audre Lorde, who, in, uh, who made this, who she talked about this in 1984. Um, she was an American writer, feminist, uh, librarian, civil rights act activist. So I think it's really important. So what do I mean here by the master's tools and uh, the master's house? Well, the master's house is this, um, you know, this kind of economic context that we find ourselves in, where we are, you know, being, where, uh, editing is being outsourced to us. And the master's tools in this sense are language, right? The English language, the way they want it spoken. So what I'm suggesting is that we can't use American English and we can't use British English to try and suggest that, hey, we're actually at par, just accept it. You know, I mean, how is that ever really going to work? So I'm suggesting that there is space for individual action, right? What do I mean by that? Um, I think we need to be, stating very clearly to people as we meet in our personal lives. And we don't, I don't think we need to do this necessarily with our clients, 
uh, but in our personal lives, when we do meet people from other cultures, when we do interact with people from these other countries, I think it's important to stay, state very clearly that we do speak Indian English because I think it's time for the world to kind of wake up and realize that yes, there are many varieties of English that, does, that do exist and there is nothing wrong with them. There's nothing subpar with them. It's a question of getting used to them, right? Um, it's a question of uh, getting used to multiple voices uh, in, in these multiple Englishes. Uh, I think, you know, as, as citizens, as people who uh, probably have a, um, you know, social media presence, uh, I'd, I'd say spread the word, raise awareness. Okay, we can write articles, we can tweet about this, we can um, Instagram it. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Um, I know that recently on a, um, on a Facebook group called the Editors Association of Earth, somebody posted something about 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 a similar about something like this, and I wrote a, a post which got a lot of attention, which I was very surprised by, uh, about the fact that hey, it's perfectly okay that your name is Japanese and that you don't speak um, uh, that that, uh, that that you know that that you are ja are Japan I have this I mean how concern was that she was had this Japanese name and people were not taking her seriously as a, an English editor um, and that she was basically facing this kind of racism. And um, so I said, you know, hey, it's perfectly fine. I think it's ridiculous. You shouldn't be working with people who don't want to work with you. But also, I speak many Englishes. I speak Australian English. I can speak British English. I do speak American English when I need to. So, but I also speak Indian English. And I also speak a lot of other languages. I speak Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati. French, English, and also, so there are many things going on in this world, and I think people need to be aware of that, right? But unless we say it, unless we put it out there, unless we talk about it, it doesn't get heard, and I think that's important. Um, I'd say we need to speak and write with confidence and power. There was a fantastic article that Aisha Chari wrote um, about exactly this topic, and she writes with a lot of power and confidence about this issue. Uh, and I think we need to continue to counter any kind of mockery of Indian like I see this all the time. There are websites um, that make fun of it. It's, it's cute, it's quaint. No, it's not. It's This is our language. This is the way we speak it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So I think it's, it's our attitude, really, in a sense, that needs to change. And what we can do is be vocal about it. So that's for individual action. Um, for group action, there are many, many things that can be done. Uh, we don't have an Indian English dictionary, as far as I can tell. Um, it would be great to have a style guide for Indian English uh, for pub, you know, so if we were writing documents in English that were being published in India, um, we don't have a style guide for that. So it would be fantastic to have that. We, it would be fantastic to have a corpus of Indian English texts, which actually something uh, Robert Lush will talk to us about at the end. Um, uh, we could have an association of English in India rather than Indian English, and I'll come to that later, actually. Uh, there could be a collaboration with other English language associations in India, so there's a kind of gathering force. And then there's training. There's training courses for government, business editors, in terms of what is English, what is Indian English, what is okay, what's not okay, what are, what is the style that, what is there, you know, is there a certain kind of um, uh, standardization of Indian English that we have? So this is what I'm suggesting that can be done within India itself. And just a couple of small things to keep in mind as I'm ending up. Um, one thing that I know is a feature of Indian English is that there's, there's this sort of wordiness and this kind of pompousness of formal English, uh, formal English writing in, in, in India it, within government and academia. And one of the things I'm suggesting is a way to overcome that is push for plain English. Okay, there's these associations um, which are usually sort of um, private, they're not government-based, uh, but there is generally a push for plain English in Western countries, Western English-speaking countries. Uh, so I think that's, that could be something that we could look at. Um, and also the idea that, uh, in fact, it's not really Indian English because we have many Englishes in India, as I found, um, you know, we, I have a friend who's from Calcutta and um, I'm from Bombay and we were talking about going to the movies and she said, did you go to the hall? Did you watch it at the hall? And I said, what, what is that? And, uh, and she meant, did you go to the cinema? And, and well, we just call that theater. So, you know, we were kind of unintelligible, uh, even though we were speaking English, Indian English, right? So, um, so I'm suggesting that we use the phrase English in India rather than Indian English. Okay, and that's it. This is a, a, bi a bibliography of you know, some of the, the references of some of the books and stuff that I read in consulting this, but that's it for now.
that's uh, all for me. Ah. Okay, great. So that was me. Um, we, uh, if you have questions, comments, please save them for the end. Uh, we'll be very happy to talk more about this. We've got Smriti Chawla next, um, and I will let her take over and explain what she's doing herself. Thanks. Hi, Tanvi. Um, is this word loud enough for everybody? Or yeah. Do I need to? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I was just wondering, in case uh, one of our uh, our panel members has internet connect uh, con internet issues, whether they want to do next, in case uh, uh, in case he loses, like Robert, if he has connection issues. If Robert's uh, having connection issues, I can play his then, point at the end. So, yeah. Fine. So he doesn't. Okay, fine. So then I'll I'll go ahead with mine. Um, how do I okay then we need to help me with this how do I upload my powerpoint uh, for a screen share oh there it is I got it Okay. Um, all right. So my topic is about idiomatic English. And uh, this is how we speak in India today. Um, before we go about explaining what Indian English is all about, let's refresh our memory on what uh, an idiom is. So an idiom is a way of expression that is different from what normal uh, the normal pattern of the usage of words is like in the traditional sense that is the American way or the British way. Um, why that happens, uh, it's usually, in a usual sentence, it's, it, the meaning of the phrase is very clearly understood, but it's not in a very conventional manner. Like it's perfectly, like for example, it's perfectly normal for us in India to say, I take coffee after dinner. Or he takes bath. He takes breakfast after bath, rather than say, you know, he has his breakfast after after he bathes. Um, the uh, every language uh, has its own stock of idioms. Sometimes they are metaphors. Sometimes they are uh, sometimes they are borrowed from other languages unknowingly, unknowingly. Uh, so when this borrowing happens, especially in a, uh, when this takes place, it's usually because the foreign language uh, and the predominant language has acquired, uh, the acquired some kind of intimate contact with the lending uh, language. So what happens is it's a hodgepodge of two languages that becomes uniquely one language. And that's pretty much how Indian English has come into being. Uh, it, this, when an idiom of the lending language is directly translated into the borrowing language, it's obviously known as loan translation, a CAC. Uh, it reflects the mental, material, and social culture of the community for obvious reasons. It's because it's a, it's a transliteration of the native language into an adapted, adapted language. And due to so many uh, languages available at our disposal here in India, uh, the Indian idioms that, that are, are very distinctively Indian at its core, and, and it has acquired the local language specific uh, that it's adapted from. Like Talmi very rightly said that when she went to Bengal and her friend used hall instead of theater or cinema. That's because that is, that's a reflection of what the social culture used over there. I mean, 
every in every state we have a different language we have a different culture it's like a mini country when we go to every state so obviously it is expected that the that the tri that the like the native language in that particular state and uh, that combines with english with british english initially will obviously give rise to another to some sort of uh, quirkiness a little bit of uh, uh differences between languages uh within india itself but ultimately because the sentence structure is so clear we kind of guess what they are talking about so it doesn't become as big an issue as we think of it so uh so there are two ways an idiom comes into being the first one is obviously when uh at the state level it is translated from uh, from colloquial use to say english and then because it gains popularity they uh, it obviously gets accepted into creative circles into writers uh, into local writing groups and then obviously the, the newspapers over there they pick up the jargon there and then it becomes popular and then everybody starts using it or it also uh, the he the a writer an indian writer obviously uses a phrase or a idiom that he is familiar with and the reader from another state thinks that you know that's a standard form of expression and then they start using it and then as a result it becomes accepted into common parlance like this half girlfriend like for example i used the word half girlfriend uh, this gave, this gave rise because a very popular author in india he decided to use this phrase to describe a girlfriend who's not who who is just dating rather than you know he's been officially they've officially defined the relationship so when that so when it said in between state that is the word that is the phrase that he used he called it a half girlfriend and as a result all over it became like a big and obviously the, since the book became a best seller everybody started to use it to uh, as a you know, oh she's not my official girlfriend she's my half girlfriend and uh, and then obviously that became popular and then now everybody uses it and then it's it's just normal to use a phrase like that and of course prepone um uh, which i think should be more widely accepted because as editors we are used to to giving the clearest possible plain plain language that shows and describes the sentence and the text as well as possible so prepone which is directly opposite to postpone uh should i mean it's an indian thing that which i think should be more widely accepted so in india uh because we have so many languages uh when it, so because we have so many languages there are we are, uh, researchers found that there are three ways of how english is taught in india it's not just you know everybody has you will find that everybody has a different way of speaking everybody has a different fluency level that is because it depends on how their uh, exposure to the language is Uh, so the first one is obviously cultivated uh, acquisition uh, which is uh, similar to how uh, most most uh, uh, most uh, most language speakers learn the language it's usually learned through school or through external sources where they come in contact with other english speakers uh the vocabulary is enhanced through print media this and the through formal education through through television uh they this this phenomenon is usually seen in the urban and suburban regions and uh, in, in all the metropolitan cities in the country where we have access to uh international languages but the difference between uh this and say a standard way of teaching which is point number 2 is that uh, they learn it uh, they learn it only in school they may or may not necessarily speak the language at home 
they may have their native language. Say, if you are in Maharashtra, where I am from, we, uh, we, the, the locals here speak Marathi. But uh, along with Marathi, like I am not a Maharashtrian, so I speak Sindhi, which is uh, from what is Pakistan now. So at home, we speak not just one language. We speak, I speak Hindi, which is our national language, unofficial. I speak Sindhi, I speak English, and I speak uh, Marathi a little bit with our, with our help at home. So uh, somebody who, who's background is not as privileged as mine, they would only learn it through a formal means of education. They wouldn't necessarily be completely uh, fluent in it because uh, they don't speak it on and off and on a regular level. And you know, they're not completely immersed in the language as opposed to someone who, is from, who learns it in the standard way, who has access to a higher level of education. They are obviously, you know, they've learned uh, English or the convent English medium education, where our missionaries and our nuns are very particular about the way our, the English the, the, the English language is taught. And then, of course, they, now with the new uh, international, international curriculum coming in, and then access to social media, to Netflix, and to international language programs, you would see that the standard way, the standard level, the people who speak standard English would are at the highest, that they are at the highest strata of society, if you could call it that, where they're extremely fluent, the the native, the almost native speakers, uh, as opposed to cultivated who who know the language very well, but they do not have the best, uh, like they would be more comfortable speaking their own language than English rather than this, whereas it's standard, they're more comfortable speaking English rather than their native language. And this is a phenomenon that is see, being seen more and more uh, these days because you know everybody likes to move up in society, be more educated, to have a more international exposure. However, we, there is still a major uh, major part of a population who are very regional. They obviously come from tired, like from smaller towns, from villages, where the NGOs, where their local schools are just teaching them English as another subject, rather than, uh, than actually encouraging them to, to be fluent in it. It's, it's like, you know, they would still go the whole uh, routine way of saying A is for apple, B is for ball, rather than visualizing. Because I remember when I was learning French here, the number one way of incorporating a language at a very comfortable level is to be completely immersed in it. I mean, it has to be all around you. You have to be, it has to be everywhere in order for you to start thinking in that language, to start start incorporating the language as part of you, of your identity. It, this is the biggest drawback that, is, that, the, that the general population in India faces because they, they, it's taught in a very uh, distinct, distinct manner. They understand the language perfectly well. Uh, they, if they would even be able to communicate with uh, foreigners and with say people of the standard at cultivated levels, but they would not be able to communicate with them due to that lack of uh, comfort with it. And this is where uh, we would find a lot of disparity, especially when these kids and this population migrates abroad. You would have different levels, you know, their mother tongue influences, so their accents are very different. Whereas if you find our accent, their accents are more neutral and almost you know, it's not Indian in the way a lot of people think Indian languages and Indian accents are. And this, this disparity is what is, I wouldn't say a drawback because uh, this is who we are. And this is what, this is what we are. And, uh, but we, but the reach, but from my, uh, from my experiences of teaching, uh, ILTS to the students who want to travel abroad. They are the hardest workers. They know they lack 
confidence and they lack the whole uh, set up to, to improve their language, but they are so enthusiastic about it. They're so eager to learn. And this is what I think we should give them a lot of kudos and a lot of credit for doing so. Then of course, uh, we, we have, uh, and of course, when I forgot to mention a point that a lot of times they transliterate their phrases into, uh, into because English is so widely accepted all over the country, rather they politically they try to transliterate uh, the language to make it easier for travelers to understand, especially since as you go state to state, every the language changes. I say transliterate rather than translate is because they phonetically try to write the same sentence uh, or the same phrase into uh, English, like, like, does anybody know what this means? What child bear means? Can anybody guess? This is supposed to be child bear. Yeah, child. yeah, yeah. Child bear. Yeah. It took me a second because, uh, well, it took me a second to realize because you know nobody eats bear that I know of here, but. But when we read the, the vernacular version of it, up, then we're like, oh yeah, it's chilled bear, beer rather than chilled bear. And then, okay. and then of course, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, Sorry. I'm going over time. Yeah, a little bit, I think let's rush. Okay, uh, I'll rush, okay. Then of course we have our uh, ways of poking fun at the language as well. Uh, then of course, white shop, where it's phonetically, we spell it and then, Burger for burger at the bottom right. Uh, okay. Okay, so why do these stresses come up? It's because uh, obviously English, as opposed to say our local languages, is a stressed time language. And it's stressed about the syllables and we have stress about the words. And obviously when you uh, stress uh, obviously, when you, when you change the stress, the meaning of the words and the meaning of the sentences obviously change. Whereas Indian native languages, like most ancient languages, are syllable timed. So they obviously, we obviously have a very a good syllabic rhythm to it. Um, unlike English, where our stress syllables rise up uh, in a pitch, we tend to lower our pitch while speaking it, and this disparity obviously creates a lot of uh, confusion, and uh, and we obviously have a tendency to put the wrong stress accents or the wrong syllables or emphasize the wrong syllables in a wrong multisyllabic word. So obviously you'll have mispronunciations, like probably, or not being able to pronounce the difference between words and words. Uh, that's only because we are not. I mean, the regional languages are not exposed to that. But once they get confidence in it, obviously we'll see the changes. And then obviously English spoken in the Indian subcontinent has some distinctive characteristics due to, you know, the pronunciation and then the influence of social media and Netflix. And uh, the more we have access to the uh, English as, you know, as we head towards a century of being of independence. The way we speak English will also change. Uh, this whole disparity between standard and acquired and received pronunciation versus regional languages, regional exposure to it will obviously change. And of course, my favorite part of everything. We have our own, and why? one of the reasons why it's important that Indian English is accepted as a form of English is because we have, one of the reasons is obviously because we have our own numerical system, which uh, obviously now if you take a minute to look at this, uh, post 10,000, uh, what we call, what you know, Americans and the British call 100,000, we still use the word one lakh. If you could see it in the digital uh, system, see the comma placements, that is different from the international system and the Indian system over here. Then obviously 10 lakhs is 1 million and 1 crore, what we call 1 crore is 10 
10 billion with all the numerical systems. And of course, as we go higher than that, then the ancient system used to be, you know, calling it Arabs or Kara or Neel or Padma. But good news is it's very rare to use uh, these terms and we have gone more into the international way of describing it rather than, um, you know. but the one lakh, 10 lakh, one crore phenomenon is still very, very pre prevalent here in India. And then of course we have stylistic uh, influences like uh, like to eat one's head, like an advertisement to our brains up. So then obviously, so it doesn't matter which part of the, of the country you are, this terminology along with, you know, politicians eat money and it shows corruption. I mean, it's, it's sacrosanct, I think, everywhere we go. And that phrase, these two phrases are extremely popular. And of course, how do we, what is, what are the characteristics of this, of Indian English is over usage of babs and sirs, politeness, uh, ex, almost antiquated levels of politeness. Uh, then of course, gentle reminders when deadlines are looming near. Um, although I came to know recently that even the Irish have a tendency to use this. And then of course, uh, because we were taught in school, the whole antiquated way of, you know, addressing someone you don't know, like a dear editor or dear human resource manager, rather than using their names or calling them by the titles, then please do the needful and yours faithfully, then till date instead of until today. Please revert back to this email rather than please respond back. Then, uh, then using uh, noun forms rather than verb forms, like, like I've used said here. Then, uh, and, uh, then everyday idioms and phrases that make Indian English so distinctive. Uh, I have found that uh, unlike our languages, our, our native languages, uh, English is a very tonal language. So if you are being polite to somebody, uh, it's the tone that, that, that shows how polite you are rather than the words uh, showing the politeness. And, as a, and because there's so much of disparity between those, we have a, we have a habit of overcompensating for the lack of, polite, of written politeness in our language. And that is why we have, uh, we tend to go verbose in it and we tend to over explanate or over emphasize on something that becomes overly uh, verbose when it comes to formal situations. It's, and then of course, there are some confusions between few okay. and a few, yeah, it's going over time. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I think you're just totally need to wrap up now, thanks. Okay. And then we have more uh, examples here that, I mean, it'll be there. <clears throat> and then of course, uh, purpose languages as a result of why I said so. So ultimately my aim here is, has been to offer you a taste of what encapsulates Indian English. Uh, there obviously, uh, like I said, there are there isn't just one version of Indian English, but there are multitudes of it as it evolves and the language changes and evolves as we move from city to state. And then of course it integrates with the neighboring country languages like uh, Bangladesh and Bengal, although they, say, they share the same language. There are, there's a lot of mix and match between the two. It, uh, the language is a reflection of what our culture and heritage stands for, or who we are as individuals. It also captures its essence and characteristics. Um, in, if you try to even, if you try to even get into what Indian English is, and people who come to come in contact with it, there would be a lot more uh, understanding and appreciation for the beauty and vivacity of the language as a whole. And then, of course, what our ultimate aim is that to accept the evolution of Indian English as an individual being, as a thriving. Being, then it stands on its own merit, and which is very distinctive and separate from its colonial past. And yeah, thank you. Yes.
how you need to stop sharing the screen yeah i'm, I'm figuring that out just give me a ah, there we go great Sorry. Thank you, Smriti. That was um, a bit long, but we're all going overboard, it seems. <laughs> We've got so yeah, much to say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's okay, so great. much to share. Yeah. There's so yeah. much to share. So, yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Okay, sorry. Can you guys mute? <laughs> okay, great. We've got Vina we got who's presenting next. I will let her do this. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. Pleased to meet you all. I hope my voice is loud and clear. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Fine. very clearly. Okay. Very clear. So my name is Veena Krishnamurti, and um, I work at the British Council, but I also run my own language institute, which is called Synchro Learn. I have uh, been privileged with the um, ability to have learned or not the ability, I would say, I have learned six languages in different contexts. So one was through an institute in the traditional way. One I learned right from my childhood, which was passed down from my parents. And then one that I uh, you know, learned in the communicative approach way that Smithy was talking about the French that is taught in the institute. And then one I learned where I lived abroad and then I picked up that was a bit of Arabic. So I've learned languages in different contexts and I have come to know that uh, language is something that keeps evolving, something that you know takes on a lot of um, things from other cultures, other traditions, other languages. And then Indian English has now you know uh, evolved the same way to take on a lot of things. So. I'm here today, um, very glad to present uh, English from the Indian tongue. So we're going to first start with a couple of sounds. We have looked at sentences, phrases, idioms, etc. So let's look at a couple of sounds, how it started from the sound level, this uh, change or modification in our speaking or writing. All right. So let's look at the first one. Can you describe these sounds? Try saying them. I'd like to hear you saying it in your own way. How would you describe these pictures, the sound that is made by each one? You could switch on your mics and tell me quickly. The shim. And the third one. Okay. So you would notice that the first one could be a whistle, a proper whistle. Okay, and the second one would be a dishum bishum, and the third one would be a zoink, zoop, anything. So it is what we feel comfortable with, and this is the first influence of our own language in England. So when we try to speak a language and we are very excited about something, what is it that we do? We pick up the sound that's the easiest for us and we incorporate it into our language to say it the way we want it because we feel that's the best effect we can give it. All right. So now let's look at uh, some sentences. Yeah. So can you guess the meaning of each of these? I'm sure all of you know it. It shouldn't be too difficult. So write oil on your head. It comes from Telugu. So this is a complete uh, you know, translation from one's own language. And then the next one is my heart went dhak dhak. Again, the sound that you're trying to produce here. You say this. And then he died off. So it's not something that just disappears, but someone who is dead. So he died off. And then what goes for you? This is very commonly used in the South. What's your problem? That's what it means. All right. And we also have sometimes the, um, the influence of pronunciation. For example, here, simply die the cannot, it's actually not, simply die the knot to the vesti up. So it just means tie the knot well so that you can keep your lungi up, the piece of cloth that you tie around you. So all these so things can be- the knot with the K sound. Is, not, is it yes, like? cannot. Oh. Yes, simply die the knot to keep the vesti up. All right, so why does this happen? What is the reason why uh, these things happen to English? Now, the first thing as all my um, 
all the experts in the panel have already said, um, one thing is to get accepted, you need to speak English. That's the language of the elite. And to be accepted, you had better well start speaking. And if you're applying, like Smithy said, if you're applying to go abroad, you need to learn the language quickly. Despite all the effort that people put in, there are things that still intervene from one's own L1 or from some other you know, acquisition. It could be from a teacher who's been teaching you because they've used it that way. It could be the surroundings or it could be the ease in which ease with which you just pick up something from some other language. So there are many reasons why people start using this. Between us, we understand this quite well. I don't think it's much of a problem. But even here, I think one or two of you did wonder what the last one meant. So this could be a problem. Sometimes we don't understand. So what, what is important here is there are two things one, one needs to understand. So when you're talking about people who are editing or who are applying to go overseas and people who are ed editing for the foreign crowd, let me say, uh, the English crowd abroad. So when you are editing for them, you're writing for them, or you're going to speak or settle down there, it is important to learn the language their way because you need to adapt to their culture, their way of speaking it. But when you are in India, you need to be able to speak like us to feel comfortable. So it's high time that we recognized our own way of speaking English and created some sort of a corpus here so that people who come to India feel the same comfort zone that we try to give people who go from here to their country. So people coming from overseas to our India, they will have to learn this if they want to feel comfortable with us, all right? So what is the reason for this Indianization? Why is it Indianized? Why are we like this only? So first thing, as I said, it's quicker to say he went zip zip. It's much faster than saying he went this way, that way, and then all that. So it makes it very lengthy. We are trying to uh, reduce our verbos verbosity here, as Tanvi and um, Smriti said. So we do not want that. We want to make it very easy. And we want to give it that Indian flavor when we speak. Sometimes, you know, there are words that are typical in Hindi or Tamil that can't be translated. It's very difficult. And when you try to describe it in some other language, it sounds really ridiculous. Try describing gulab jamuns to somebody who doesn't you know, really understand what it is. So try describing it. So it's very difficult. It sounds ridiculous. It's almost on the verge of you know, sounding crude sometimes. There could be cultural uh, differences also. For example, even the word sleepover, so somebody comes and spends a night with you. Um, so try saying that in, in, uh, in uh, you know, Hindi or uh, in your own country, in your own language. Someone, my friend came to spend the night here. It sounds very odd to us because it's a practice that we don't have here, all right? So sometimes it's very difficult to translate these concepts which are foreign into Indian languages. So sometimes we try to adapt and come up with our own expressions for it. Now, cultural and traditional differences. There are so many things, for example, putting, you know, drawing designs. It's not actually drawing a design, it is putting a column. It's very difficult to change it to something else because sometimes you color it, sometimes you have uh, straight lines and all that. So it's not just a design. So converting this to explain to somebody sometimes doesn't have the same flavor that you're trying to uh, convey. The other thing is that there are certain um, traditional practices that are followed here that still haven't come out into the open. The world doesn't know about it. So it's very difficult when you're trying to describe this to somebody, the value of what we are doing, the importance of uh, you know, how it is done and all that, it's very difficult to convey it to somebody else. So what we try to do is we use the same word and just hope for the best. Now, the other thing is the influence of L1. So we have this habit of being um, you know, respectful to everybody, which is a very nice thing. So some people feel that we are not respectful because we sometimes speak a little loudly and our language doesn't have it. We do have that respect. We do show respect in our language, but how do we do it? We say Mataji, Raviji, so these are ways of showing respect. And we say, ah, like in French, you, you have vous. And we have the same kind of thing, all right? So just because some, some people speak a little loudly doesn't mean that it is a very rude language. 
So uh, influence of L1 here, trying to convert your practice into um, you know, something that can be followed in English is another reason. Now, another reason why uh, English is Indianized is because you won't have that sense of belonging. All right. When your entire group speaks the same way, I remember when I was in college, when somebody spoke elite English, you know, the correct, beautiful English with the correct pronunciation, we would feel very uncomfortable hanging around those people. We said, oh, wow, you know, these people are absolutely there and we are some sort of a lower um, uh, low, we are some sort of a lower being for not being able to speak as well as them. So should we feel that? Should anybody feel that just because you don't speak like them? So that shouldn't be the case. And sometimes, you know, as I said, groups, they want to identify themselves with a certain group. They need to follow the way they speak. So sometimes it could be because of pronunciation. Sometimes it could be because of words. Sometimes it's just jargon that is used in the group that you know, just like the way you go to, a, you start working in a company, you pick up certain words just to make yourself understood by the group there. It's the same thing. Your community wants to accept you. You need to speak like them sometimes. Then the medium of instruction is another thing why it is Indianized. Now, we all know that not everybody has a master's in English. Not everybody has a BA in English. Not everyone has formal education in English. Yet there are millions of teachers out there in villages doing their best to teach English. And what they do is distort the language a little bit, which many people don't like, but then they are making that effort. You have to give it to them that they're doing their best. They have not had any kind of formal training. They're just trying to pass on whatever they've learned. So this passing on whatever they learned to somebody comes out as what the teacher knows whatever has been passed on. So there is a lot of Indianization there and the regional influence is also there. Then sometimes it's also poor imitation. So sometimes you're trying to speak the way someone else speaks. You pick up their accent, but then it comes out very poorly. So all these reasons influence Indian English. So the reason why we are talking about this is to <clears throat> understand that we needn't feel bad about it. This is the way we are. We need to create something um, where people can understand what we are saying, all right? So at, a, um, at the language level, what is it that happens? So we add suffixes like ing, as uh, Smriti has already said, we add ing to verbs to make it sound, uh, you know, more, um, for example, I am WhatsApping my friend. So the word WhatsApp exists, but WhatsApping my friend doesn't exist, but we love saying it that way, all right? and adding a mark of respect, and then combining words. For example, take it easy is such a long one. I'd love to say chilmadi. It's so easy, right? So that's one thing. And then translating, and then adding a definite article wherever they want to, using double words to add in effect, slowly, slowly, easily, easily, all right? And very recently, I also heard this, but yes, um, do children, for example, this question, do children in uh, India like playing with colors? Yes, they like playing with colors, but yes, they use a lot of colors. So this but yes has been used just because they've heard it somewhere, but it's not used correctly. So these things also happen, all right? But they don't harm anyone's comprehension, all right? Now let's look at the global opinion of what Indian English sounds like and what people feel about it. So I carried out a survey recently, and this is what came out of it. Most Indians who live in India, they love Indian English, but they do want to come out of that shell and be accepted by people who speak real English. All right. But there are people outside in different countries who um, you would notice that they also identify with this English, but they fail to understand it completely. All right. So you will see that out of the group here, um, most of the people who answered uh, this survey, they were born in, uh, in India. Uh, some live in India, some live abroad and the different countries to which they, uh, from where they are from, it's all um, outlined here. So we have people from America, from um, um, Singapore, from UK, Malaysia, etc. So all these people, they answered the survey and what is the actual place where they live in? 
So we see that Indians, we have people from Ahmedabad and we have people from Andhra, we have uh, from Gujarat, sorry, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, UP. So Indians from almost all over the place. And then um, the others, we have uh, Bahrain, we have Japan, the Netherlands, Malaysia, the UAE, USA, so Singapore. So there are a lot of people who have uh, sent in their responses to this. So what do they feel about this Indian English? This was very interesting. So most pe people feel happy about it. This came as a huge surprise. Um, so when they hear someone saying, um, someone talking in Indian English, they find it amusing. They find it, um, they find it a language that they can identify with. All right. There are, of course, some some who feel you know it's disgusting to hear English being massacred like this. So they are the purists, I suppose. Um, there are people who don't understand what it is. So there are, um, th and there is also a group that finds it very funny. So we have all sorts of responses to this. So let's look at why people feel the way they do. I'll allow you to read this quickly. So some people, for them, it didn't make much of a difference. For some, well, uh, they felt a lot of disappointment because they could not, uh, you know, be a part of the group. Dina? Yes, almost at the last slide. Thank here. you. Yeah. So moving on. So when I asked them, would you like to learn Indian English? So what we noticed was that some of them said maybe, and some of them said yes. So we have about 20% which said yes, and we have about 28% uh, which said maybe. So if we come up with a good corpus, which is useful to them, uh, I think we have a very good market out there for Indian English. So with this week, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Veena. That was that was great. That um, I think it's generated a lot of discussion on the chat. We're having a bit of fun with that. Uh, thank you. That was really interesting, and it's so true. We do speak so many languages, and they all sort of filter into each other. Um, English into Tamil, Tamil into English, Gujarati into English, all sorts of things going on. So yeah, it's, it, it does. It is quite amusing, but at the same time, like you pointed out, it is the way we talk. So um, we have to accept it. Absolutely. Okay, up next is Muragaraj. Thank you, Danny. Sure. Give me a moment. Hi, hey, greetings to everybody. And uh, we already have a wonderful session. Uh, the three speakers have shared their perspectives on the Indian English. And I'm going to talk about uh, academic writing, uh, Indian English and academic writing. I have been an editor for uh, 15 years. Most of the times I've been working on academic uh, journals and academic journals and books. Uh, so I thought I'll take this opportunity to talk about some of the uh, uh, Indian English way of writing things. So my focus is more to be uh, more uh, on the syntax part of it. Um, when we talk about uh, um, academic uh, writing, you know, Indian English and academic writing, there, there are uh, some some common errors that we uh, see. Some some of them are okay. Uh, I have I have to be very specific. It, they are not not necessarily errors. My my heading is misleading. Uh, in fact, noun stacking, verbosity, uh, overuse of passive voice, they are not errors. Uh, I think I should have uh, put it differently. Uh, but these are all very commonly found in Indian writing. And in, in fact, this is, uh, this is common in any, anybody's writing whose English is not uh, their first language. Um, I, without any order and uh, with no preference for one over the other, I have collated some of the most common uh, changes that I would, uh, uh, I would do or some of the most common uh, syntax that I come across in academic writing. So the most common is nominalization and uh, noun stacking. Okay, 
uh, as, as you understand, nominalization is using a noun when a verb is more than enough. Okay. For example, if you consider the example sentence one here, uh, structural characterization of the synthesized nano crystal was was. Structural characterization of the synthesized nanocrystal was done using X-ray diffraction spectroscopy. So you can see that uh, characterization was done is a subject and the verb part of it, but this could have been written differently and in a more straightforward manner by saying that the synthesized nanocrystals or the structure of the synthesized nanocrystals were characterized using X-ray diffraction spectroscopy. Okay. Um, but what we have done, what the authors norm normally do is to uh, convert the verb characterize into characterization and then add a verb so that a subject and verb is needed. Uh, another common uh, word, choice of word is words like done, get and be, uh, uh, put. Okay, these are some of the verbs that we very commonly use when, we are, when the authors are not very uh, specific or, or cannot find a specific choice of verb. Okay, uh, so characterization was done, measurements were done, and all. So in, in anything that was done, we use the word done. Okay, uh, this can be easily substituted with a more appropriate verb. Uh, as in the second example, we can see powder second harmonic generation measurements were conducted. Okay, this could have been written, or we normally uh, you know rewrite as part of editing process as second harmonic generation pulses or signals uh, were measured using powder crystals. Okay, this, this needs a bit of uh, subject understanding also. So, I mean, I'm hoping that most of the editors work on subjects that they are comfortable with that. So with that assumption, so this could have been written differently as second harmonic generation signals or pulses were measured or uh, yeah, were, were measured using powder uh, crystals. Similarly, uh, another Another, another uh, you know, common thing is noun stacking. Okay. Universities will need to determine the system best suited to those entering public and private domains in South Africa, where the majority of persons are African. Is there a way I can mute uh, the chat? It keeps coming in between where I uh, making my reading difficult. Okay. Um, where the majority of persons are African language mother tongue speakers. Okay, so the phrase African language mother tongue speakers could have been written differently as uh, mother tongue speakers of African language. All right, so majority of persons, num, I mean, I uh, edited that as majority of them or, or simply where the majority are uh, mother, mother tongue speakers of African language. Okay, so uh, with respect to nominalization, uh, the best way is to, you know, identify the verb that was made into a noun and then promote it again as a verb. And with respect to nouns taking, rearranging with, uh, with, the, with the use of some prepositions and uh, most possibly prepositions so that the flow is uh, much better. Uh, another, another, another thing that we come across most commonly is uh, the words allow and permit, especially the choice of the word allow in uh, explaining uh, scientific concepts and methods and uh, description, okay. Uh, we need a, we, we need an object for the verb uh, allow and permit. Okay, uh, so we can write this first sentence as uh, the working the the working of principle is based on injecting the fuel directly in the combustor chamber and allowing the quick mixing of the fuel. Okay, what we need is a, a object for the verb allow. If you do not have an object, what we can do is we can convert the verb that is given here into a gerund form. So making it a noun equivalent. So allowing quick mixing of the fuel with a large fraction of air. By the same logic, we could have uh, the, the second sentence could be rewritten as techniques such as long read uh, sequencing may allow the detection of very low level somatic events. For example, detect in this case as a direct, uh, you know, a noun equivalent. So we have, uh, we used detection instead of allow detecting very low level somatic events as in the, unlike in the first case. 
when you consider the third example the intrinsic properties applied as toxicity predictors allow to explain so in this case uh, it is not about the direct object of what was allowed rather uh, allowed somebody to do something structure is used here so a normal uh, way to do is to appropriately insert the uh, you know a pronoun that indicates a person here allow us to explain is one possibility or you can be more specific and then say predictors uh, allow the researchers to explain the toxicity mode of action allow the doctor to explain so we can we can be more specific with re with respect to the noun if you know that or we can go for uh, a more generic indefinite pronoun in that case another case is confusing conjunctions with adverbs okay especially uh, subordinating conjunctions with sentence adverbs that's what i actually mean here for example if you look at uh, the first sentence the carnot cycle is the most efficient cycle operating between the same temperature source and the same uh, temperature sink while it has not been a reality due to the associated challenges and there are more, this is actually an error okay but there are uh, there are more than one ways to uh, correct this one way is to um, bring the second sentence uh, i mean we, we can we can add the second sentence into the one in the first one so you can say the carnot cycle uh, blah 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 and the same temperature sink comma while it has not been a reality due to the associated challenges alternatively you can um, substitute however uh, instead of while and retaining the independent nature of the second sentence as such um, as an independent sentence um, the second example you can see that there is a comma also there after uh, uh, after the conjunction here the subordinating conjunction which is almost always wrong in fact i cannot think of a situation where we need a comma after a subordinating conjunction i couldn't come up with any okay so once again the second sentence can be run on with the previous uh, sentence or you can substitute with but or however uh the efficiency is independent okay and and the choice of whether you are running on with the previous sentence or you are going to substitute with uh, a sentence adverb like however uh, and it depends solely on the context and the meaning that you are trying to convey here there is no one right uh, answer the next possibility is the use of expletives and uh, over use of emphasis okay for example uh, we we um, you know let's consider the sentence it's raining we all know that it's raining the it here is simply empty it doesn't refer to anything else but we are actually referring to the uh, rain okay but you cannot rewrite it in any other manner, manner. Uh, contrast uh, with the second example i mean the first sentence given here it is important to understand the potential applications of deuterium incorporation and this is a completely acceptable uh, structure where Uh, but can be rewritten as differently uh, rewritten differently as understanding the potential applications of deuterium incorporation is important okay so the it here acts as um, you could you, you cannot say that it is completely empty but it is used to uh, it it is there to indicate something that is going to come little later okay uh, so instead of uh, saying to understand the potential applications at the end of the sentence which is actually the subject of the sentence we can bring it around and then say understanding the potential applications is important contrast that with the next sentence there is an important need to understand the potential applications this is acceptable and again you can write understanding this is an important need is not a more natural way of writing it so in the first case you can write it either way in the second case uh, it's more natural to write it as given here again contrast that with another example another sentence here there is an urgent need to understand the potential applications it is almost difficult to rewrite this uh, understanding this is an urgent need uh, it doesn't um, you know it doesn't it doesn't feel natural so even for the similar construction among the three cases the way it is written or the way it can be re uh, rewritten from one end to the other is not the same and the fourth one is completely different okay we call them expletives expletives are um, existential clauses where the there or here is used to 
indicate the presence of something and that is combined with words like available exist okay which makes it verbose the fourth sentence can be read it as many studies are available in the subject on the subject it's a simple and straightforward way of saying that or you can say there are many studies on the subject either one either is acceptable but a combination of there are and available on the subject makes it a little verbose and uh, unnatural and these are some of the examples um, you can come across uh, you can the, the more you start working with uh, academic writing of uh, somebody suggested not to say native okay i'm trying to find out an alternative to do that uh, so if english is not our first language and uh, it's also not we are not fluent speakers or writers of english then it is possible that um, such constructions creep in because the aim of the authors is more about uh, what they are trying to communicate rather than about the syntax okay and as editors uh, we are in between the reader and the author and the author's intention to convey their thought in a more professional way or in a more standard format rather uh, to the readers so as editors what we can do is to identify instances that can be uh, corrected like this in fact the ideas for uh, some of these um, changes uh, are putting this into a presentation came from uh, another blog post written based out of a question by uh, our fellow icf member suridath suridas to uh, editors association association of earth on facebook so he asked what are the, the dead giveaways uh, that uh, the person is an indian author so it was a very interesting conversation uh, in the um, in the facebook group and then we try to collate them into a blog post and then uh, we wrote this uh, blog post a couple of years ago and uh, from then on it was it was always interesting to identify something as indian before that um, i i didn't tend to identify that as indian or maybe as south asian or southeast asian but the moment um, we were able to uh, see that people see this as indian or uh, differently uh, also gives us a perspective as editors okay when the audience is international when uh, the writing needs to be more standard okay again pardon my uh, choice of word okay uh, so as editors we have that you know ability to convert from one form to another uh, fitting uh, to the right expectations uh, to the expectations of the right audience so i think um, uh, this is this session is a wonderful start for that and i'm looking forward to uh, you know many more uh, initiatives with respect to building a corpus on indian in indian english and the dictionary on indian english and many other activities associated with it thank you all for the wonderful time thank you murugraj that was fantastic i am going to hold you to that uh, i believe you've just said it in a forum that you would like to be part of this so hopefully we can get together a team and um so i see my videos off uh, hopefully we can get together a team and 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 really get to work on these uh, things that i've suggested earlier and that we're all sort of seeing the benefit of um okay fantastic um academic indian english um okay we've got two more speakers um there's in the pre next talk to us about indian indian fiction okay in the pre take it away towards uh thank you tanvi um hello everyone um uh, okay i'll just share my screen give me a second hello and welcome thank you cora and this is kaniz oh sorry kaniz i your voice sounded very severe i'm so sorry just give me a second um um can you all right so i am here to talk about uh indianisms and um, indian fiction indian writing okay just a moment um all right is it is it clear is it visible i'm not sure yes we can we can see that um uh, right. in see the slides thanks Yes, clear. So there, there are a lot of things around the screen. So I'm getting a little, 
I don't know. Okay, here goes. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be basically talking about Indian fiction and Indian writing and uh, how uh, I think that Indianisms are a crucial part of uh, Indian writing. Indian fiction should be written in Indian English or English that is Indian, right? Uh, and I'm sure uh, having heard the previous uh, members, uh, you would also agree that we really need to up the level for that. So that's me. Um, yeah. So when I talk about uh, Indianisms, uh, we generally try to express something that's uniquely Indian. It's already been shared with you. Lovely examples have been uh, given earlier. And I really don't need to explain on that. But you understand. I'm sure all of you would be nodding your head. Oh, yes, I have read something similar in fiction books, which uh, uh, by Indian authors that you, you would have read, uh, whether it's a recent book or uh, uh, older author, you would find things. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are some Indianisms or some aspects of Indian writing that uh, become better when you sort of express them in the Indian way, whereas there are others that are not so much. All right. Uh, but uh, English are, is you definitely colored by our environment and how we grew up, where we learned our English from. So I discovered these Indianisms and the uh, quirks so-called of Indian writing when I started reading a lot of Indian fiction. Because um, as a typical uh, child who was brought up on, um, uh, you know, convent educated English, uh, the initial reading uh, was definitely not Indian authors, except maybe Ruskin Bond. Uh, it was just it didn't start from there. So the initial uh, Indian uh, authors were quite later on. And then I realized that even I use them when I'm speaking or even when I'm writing. And it's due to our uh, cultural influences and how we grew up and where we grew up from. I am a Punjabi or a Sadar. So I have that uh, typical uh, Punjabi touch also, even when sometimes I'm speaking or I'm uh, conversing with my friends. So uh, that's how it comes to everybody. And uh, I feel that, uh, uh, it's something that we should embrace. Though I have also realized that we do not find these Indianisms in books by Indian authors who are abroad or who are uh, settled abroad or have had a good exposure outside. It uh, definitely is there for authors who are, um, I would say rather thoroughly based in India or something like that. So we, at the same time, we can't say that we don't have good Indian books. Uh, this is a gripe that I hear from a lot of people uh, uh, when uh, I suggest some Indian writing to them. They're like, oh God, Indian books, what are you talking about? But uh, at the same time, there might be, let's say, uh, a book which uh, people would just dismiss as being uh, absolutely useless. But then there are authors who are winning awards who regional translations that are winning awards. So we can't say that our, our fiction is not good enough or it cannot be compared to the best books abroad. Right now I'm, I'm reading the uh, book, a shortlisted uh, book by Avni Doshi. So, uh, and it's as amazing as the vegetarian, which I had read a couple of uh, years ago. So uh, I think your, uh, your regional uh, input or your uh, personal influence on your English adds to the flavor of your writing. I started reading as would have most of the people around my age group would be with uh, Vikram Seth or Salman Rushdie and uh, Arundhati Roy who were really uh, Jhumpa Lairi. These were the authors that I thought what English, Indian English or Indian fiction writing was about. And uh, I was thoroughly impressed. But of course, having read the foreign authors, then I initially started reading Indian authors and uh, as it was just mentioned some time ago with half girlfriend, even before that, uh, Chetan Bhagat had done a couple of books and uh, love him or hate him, he made India read. And I think the reason he connected with India is his writing was so simple and uh, people from two tier, three tier cities could understand what he's writing rather than if you suggest somebody to read uh, maybe <laughs> by any of these authors, they would think twice that, oh no, I can't even understand half of what they're writing. So I, I think that once when you're writing in your Indian English, when you're writing in, in a language that is simple or that what you've learned and you've grown up to, how you converse, that adds to the value to your book. 
Indian writing or, or writing about uh, things that are truly quintessentially Indian would be uh, would be much much better if you're using the language that you've grown up with rather than trying to you know copy something uh, from uh, other authors or copy the style of other authors your native aspect your regional flavor your uh, personal touch is what makes your writing different so uh, we've had an amazing discussion till now so we obviously know that indian english does exist it's not something that we've just come up with it's been there with us throughout so uh, as the mark of an assimilating a uh, language into a new or a different country is when we have a healthy mix of words from both the countries that is what i uh, talk about when i say that your book if written in indian english will will make a lot of difference because we have phrase words like ashram yogi and jungle uh, they are used uh, as perfectly normal words and nobody points them out as being typically indian or you know something that we would not use so if if we are able to have a set um, a style guide or a dictionary or something like that for our indian english the words that we now talk of or uh, call indianisms or you know something very specific to uh, indian um, uh, uh, writing would be taken as a norm it would not be something that would be pointed out or people would you know look down upon you because you read indian english and uh, now after reading indian authors for the past 25 30 years i have all i have seen is an, a tremendous amount of growth a tremendous uh, uh, amount of rich literature that has come to be uniquely indian and i'm not even talking about the amazingly good translations from regional literature so uh, india writes because india reads uh, uh, i'm sure you would you would have uh, heard of the surveys done where they say india is one of the nations which reads the most and the it reads because uh, people write because uh, india wants to read and uh, most of the uh, readers are those who have not had in english as their first language of uh, learning uh, like tanvi said you know they would have learned it maybe when they are five or seven or somewhere around that age so it's important for them to be able to identify to the kind of english that they grew up on and now uh, like it or hate it with the covid situation uh, that is what i have seen is a explosion of self publishing and a uh, you know a lot of people uh, having uh, thought of that this is the perfect time to publish or share the work that i was writing a lot of closet novelists so to say have come out and want to publish their work along with it has brought a lot of unique indian voices and uh, the books that are showcasing our life right now our, com our contemporary life or the life that we have uh, we are seeing around us is is what is winning we a lot of books that are doing really well so if we have books specific to a, a specific area or a culture they are winning people want to read about it what i i would like to point out is that when we read books let's say a novel set in the world war 2 or amish fiction if you read that or historical romance which uh, are very popular books uh, people want the the right language they want the right setting and i have seen reviews of books where they have readers have pointed out a tiny error that no you you are talking about this specific uh, error and this kind of um, a, a, a machine or a tea set or this kind of uh, dresses were not prevalent during that era that you've written about so it's the same thing when we talk about indian english like the previous example of gulab jamun was given in fact that is uh, that is uh, there's a link i have uh, shared in the end that also uh, it talks about the same thing madhuri vijay she in her interview mentioned the same thing in in that uh, the gulab jamun description if you're trying to give in a book in, uh, written in indian uh, for indian audiences is uh, totally not done because it's hard to think that somebody would not know what it is and you can't describe it like a of uh, you know fried dumpling or something like that so that doesn't work so uh, what i would like to say is don't base your books uh, you know on popular influences from outside because uh, it you're just trying to copy somebody so that shouldn't be there here is just a random list of authors which i'm sure most of them you would have heard so there are a couple of them highlighted because i think when i talk of meena uh, kandasami her her book uh, her poetry is heart hitting but her book when i hit you is uh, amazingly uh, great at it not only makes you think but you the writing is so amazing that you feel you are with the protagonist in with her when she is in you know suffering in her life 
then when i talk of translations perumal murugan is an amazing author all his uh, stories they are uh, they have such a rich regional flavor so much to talk about and they come out amazing uh, they they're excellent and uh, it the the importance the depth of the writing is because it puts you in that rich environment about which he's writing it's not as if you you're watching it it's like you're right there that is what good writing is about then we of course we have ruskin bond devdat patnaik if you want to do uh, read indian uh, my, about indian mythology sudha murthy again is a big hit i've asked um, you know youngsters around me that why do uh, you like to read her so much again a, a lady who writes very simply and her uh, language just connects with the reader she she has a lot of lessons but they identify they understand that it's it's about them it's from around them another two authors have another high, uh, i've also highlighted uh, sundari uh, venkatraman and neel de silva both of them are new they are um, indie authors published with the amazon uh, kdp but sundari is the number one kdp author in india for i think 3 years and neel is for horror and if you want typically indian horror in which you have pishaj and um, i don't know because i don't read horror so i can't even tell you the names uh, but all his horror books are best sellers why because their voices are uniquely indian uh, sundari talks about indian romances uh, and you would feel that this is a story of maybe a neighbor or a friend next door uh, that is the kind of uh, environment or the uh, ambience she creates in her the novel so you can identify it True, uniquely indian chetan bhagat we have to talk about because he is what made india read and even though people love to diss him but then along with chetan bhagat there are authors like ravinder singh sudeep nagarkar even savi sharma they all uh, all have identified with the youth with the youngsters the uh, from across the country so okay. that's can, that's can you wrap up you. sorry i think you need to wrap up it's uh, right. very very all right so that's just about it what i uh, i want to say that uh, you know you have to embrace your indianisms you have to embrace indian english uh, and uh, that's how a writer can associate with his audience and a reader will connect with the author that's what makes the difference uh, i i that uh, i'll just finish it up you can read it across uh, your being authentic is what is always appreciated all the books that have won awards or are very popular have unique voices they they talk about something very very indian you can add, uh, so again the movement the thought that our own voices should be heard and why not in our own language so as i say be indian write indian uh, these are couple of links which you can uh, read across about this and i just uh, leave you with this uh, note of thank you that let go of the thoughts that don't make you strong similarly let go of the language that doesn't make your writing strong thank you so much thank you indapreet that was great i think we really enjoyed that and i certainly was um, really happy to see this list which i will be uh, consulting soon Oh, all um, right thank you but uh, just tell me how to stop this uh, you're going to do a stop stop sharing i think all right uh stop sharing the option is okay i i stopped it for you thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> no worries um okay so next up and our last presenter i know it's been a long session i'm really sorry but we've just clearly had so much to say um our last presenter very very interesting quite different from everything we've been doing so far uh, robert lash robert would you just like to say hello and show your face first hello can you hear me yes we yes, can yes we can hear you okay go you okay good <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble. I, I drift out with the sound uh, from your point of view. I can't tell whether you can hear me clearly or not. So uh, I re recorded what I uh, my presentation, and, and it might be safer than than me crashing out in the middle. Yeah, and, and not knowing where to pick up things. Okay, that sounds good. So Robert's been having a lot of connectivity issues, so he keeps dropping in and out, and he was afraid that that would happen. So um, he very thoughtfully actually did a sort of audio, or, uh, has placed an audio recording into his presentation. So I will just play that on his behalf since I seem to have a fairly stable uh, connection. Thank you, Robert, and hopefully you can stick. You know, you'll still be around at the end, and we can do uh, and take yeah. part question answer session. That would be great. I'll be there. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. 
Sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to make this work. Okay, so um, is this just? Hello, I'm Robert Lush. I live in Puerto in West Bengal. So, what is the purpose? That should be the next screen. So down the what is the purpose? A corpus is a massive online database of texts. A corpus may well contain over a billion words. We measure the size of a corpus by counting the number of words. Even so, the basic unit is a sentence. We upload complete sentences that have been gathered from real life documents. A corpus may also include transcripts made from recorded speech. We also load additional information about each sentence, such as its source and its style. So, a corpus is a collection of many complete sentences. However, each word is also tagged individually. So, similar to Google search, the user can select all the sentences that contain a particular word or phrase. Move to screen five when you're ready. A pioneering corpus was co-build. It was first developed in 1987 in the UK. It's a product of a partnership between the book publishers Harper Collins and Birmingham University. An innovation of Collins using co was to use their corpus to include example sentences in their dictionaries. Readers look up words in alphabetical order in the traditional way, but each different definition includes example sentences. Collins also maintain a subset of co-build expressly designed to help learners of English. Software. Um, Sketch Engine is the corpus software that I'm evaluating. Collins and other publishers and academic institutions and the European community now use Sketch Engine software as one of their tools in maintaining their corpora. Now I'll show you three screenshots produced by Sketch Engine. The first screenshot is taken from the free system SCAL, which stands for Sketch Engine for Language Learning. This search is on the word early. For this first screen, I have clicked on the examples tab. Yep. For this first screen, I have clicked on the examples tab. Every single sentence in the corpus that contains the word early is displayed. In each sentence, early is highlighted in red.
skip to the next screen when you're ready. This second screen comes up by clicking on the tab Word Sketch. You see details about early as an adjective. If you toggle the screen, you see details of early as an adverb. The purpose is to highlight all the different ways early appears within this corpus. It may be useful, for example, to highlight which prepositions are associated with early. Versions of SCAL exist in several languages, but so far, none for a South Asian language. Skip to screen nine. With the previous two screens were produced by SCAL, which is a subset of Sketch Engine aimed at language learning. This third stream is output from the full version of Sketch Engine. Starting in the top left-hand corner, we see the following. The corpus is the British Academic English Corpus. The display shows a concordance extracted from this corpus of academic texts. A concordance is simply a list of all the sentences that contain a particular word. Here, the word investigated is complaint. These lists and much other analysis is produced on demand for any word or phrase at speeds, speeds comparable to Google search. Skip to screen 10 when you're ready. Corpora are constructed in any language that can be written down, either using its own script or by transliteration. Bilingual corpora exist. They aid in translation and in language learning. Diachronic corpora are updated regularly with new entries to show how a language has changed over time. Special corpora are set up for contemporary topics such as coronavirus or Brexit. Childers, Child Language Data Exchange System, records transcripts of children learning their first language. Such corpora now exist in many languages. Skip to screen 11 when you're ready. How are corpora used? They are used for language and linguistic research, for example, investigating language change, for computer-aided translation, for language learning, for creating and maintaining dictionaries and thesauruses, for creating style manuals. Finally, as source material to design text processing applications, such as spell checkers, grammar checkers, and software to enforce style guides. Skip to screen 12 when you're ready. Creating a new corpus. Many corpora are freely available, but none exist for in, in English. So we need a new one. We would gather our text 
by using any existing or available corpora, finding online archives, using software to crawl the internet, looking for texts originating in India, and by creating individual examples ourselves, checking them, batching them up, and uploading them into the corpus. Step. Creating a new corpus. Many corpora are freely available, but none exists for in in English. So we need a new one. We would gather our text by using any existing available corpora, finding online archives, using software to crawl the internet, looking for text originating in India, and by creating individual examples ourselves, checking them, batching them up, and uploading them into the corpus. Skip this. So what do we propose to do? We should, we should learn to use sketch engine software and use it to set up a corpus of English as used in India. We should use sketch engine to extract text that is available on the internet. That's the number. We should load text yeah. from documents. Of, huh? I got a debit card, yeah. No. Can you can give him you have a debit card. I can't stop the uh, Um, I think that was it. Robert, did I get that right? That's right. That's finished. Okay. Um, All right. Over to you now. If there was something else you wanted to add. No, that, that's, that's all. Sorry about the sound, but okay. We got through it anyway. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of these things are free, so people can try them out on the, on, on their, uh, on their machines if they want to. Yes, that, that um, I think uh, we'll definitely be sharing these, yes, Vivek, the slides. Yes. And so people can um, have a look at the, um, the websites that we've suggested. Um, and, and Robert, can they start, can we start adding things into the corpora? Or I, need to, doing that? I, I need to, to tell people what is required in terms of a sentence and, um, and, and background material. So. I, I haven't started on that because we've been preparing this for this presentation, but that's the next thing on my agenda. So next next week I'll be doing that. Okay. Okay. I think if you could um, sort of put together a, a list of what we could be doing or how we could help you or, you know, who, or maybe you want a core team to work with this, um, to work on this with you. I don't, I don't know how you see this um, sort of proceeding, but if you could chart that out and maybe post it in the Indian Copy Editors Forum, um, okay. I think that would be really helpful. One thing is that um, it's driven by people, what people are interested in and what they need. So I know we're interested in language learning and in academic English and, and maybe the colloquial, the, the spoken English. So if I have a better idea of other things that people are interested in, then, uh, then we can uh, adjust our searches so that we can uh, take that into account. Okay, sure, sounds good. Okay, so I think we're, that's it. We've, we're at the end of our six presentations. I'm sorry, it's taken much longer than we thought it would, um, but here we are. We're at the end and we're open for any questions, answers, like questions or comments or 
any kind of discussions, maybe for another 15 minutes, if that okay? Uh, hi, Tanvi, can I speak? Tanvi, hi, Peter here. Yeah. Hi, hi, Peter. Hi, how are you? I just posted a query here on the chat. Can you please re respond to that? Can you see some Indian authors, you know, who write yeah. dialogues in Hindi? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some Indian authors write dialogues in Hindi using transliteration and then translate into English. They think they translate the text within brackets, long passages of such text. What do you think about that? Are we talking about fiction? Yes, fiction, fiction. So when you're writing a fiction and uh, the context, the set, setting is Indian, so people tend to, when people are talking to say some staff members, they respond in Hindi. So mm -hmm. there are long conversations which they are having in Hindi. So mm -hmm. they use transliteration and then they play, place the English translation within brackets. Yeah, sometimes occasionally it doesn't, it's not so visible, so it's okay. But when there are long passages, it, to my eyes, it looked a little odd. So I just wanted to know about the popular opinion. What do you people think about this? I would suggest if there were long passages of quoted text uh, in fiction, perhaps you can do a, because if it's an English speaking audience and the book, the book uh, is in English, perhaps mm -hmm. you need the, the transliteration, right? Or you don't need, I mean, maybe just the translation yeah. suffice. Yeah. yeah. Should be avoided, do you think? All crime controls hunger and diet. Uh, uh, and fatigue. Okay, we've got some, a lot of noise. Also, sorry, I don't know from where. I'm okay. sorry. I suppose like uh, the lady is talking to uh, her domestic help yeah. and she responds in her language and that conversation is going on. Do you think we should, we can uh, give, I mean, make them uh, the either those dialogues in English rather than saying it in Hindi? I think, Indapreet, what do you think? She's the fiction guru here. Who? Uh, uh, I would suggest that you go with writing them in English because having uh, too much of, uh, uh, you know, the Hindi portion or the translation, uh, it would be difficult for the reader also to uh, read the same thing twice and understand that. So maybe uh, one odd word is fine, but not too many long passages. Yeah, and most of the uh, readers would be uh, familiar with Hindi at least because it is for the Indian audience. Yes, so exactly. 90% of uh, them. That's what I thought, but yeah, this is why I wanted to know what's like. Yes, uh, and if there's some specific words, like uh, some authors have that thing that they would write uh, maybe a name or some endearment which they wanted to be a typically Hindi or an Indian word. So yeah. then that once introduced can be explained the first time and then it can just continue as a regular yeah. word. You could be in a good position uh, actually in this regard because this lady is also from army background and she uses terms like G Janab and all, which she would like to have it the kind of effect the G Janab gives okay. cannot come in English. And this is why that was the dilemma there in her case. Yeah. So then maybe that one odd word can be added. It will add a little unique uh, touch to the script manuscript. Yeah. That can be there. Yeah. I mean, uh, Preeta, maybe there's also the idea that you know this this book, when published, could possibly be picked up by people who are not Indians, uh, yeah. but are interested in reading it. So then, having long passages in in Hindi plus a transliteration plus a translation would be just completely over the top. Yeah. And I guess, sorry. So I think to convey the flavor of the fact that this is a, you know, that, the, that this person is making a distinction between their language usage in terms of, well, I use Hindi to talk to the domestic help and I use English to talk to, you know, other army wives or the generals or whatever. I think, uh, you know, in the people's right, you just need to give a flavor of it. So throwing these few things here and there um, should be, you know, possibly enough. But okay, I know. I know. The extent people can take it, or you can take it, and it doesn't become too much for the eye. Or even for reading, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Okay, great. Hello. Yeah. This is Venkatesh. I have Hi. a question for Inter. Hi, Tanvi, how are you? Okay. I have a question for Indrapreet. Uh, does she edit, uh, Indrapreet, do you edit uh, Indian novels, which means uh, novels written by Indian authors? And uh, I want to know what are your challenges there and if you also edit academic or other forms of uh, writing how do you contrast that with that 
with the experience of uh, editing Indian uh, author based work. Thank you. You are on mute in the play. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Venkatesh. I uh, I do uh, fiction editing mainly, so I have edited a lot of Indian authors. Uh, not much of uh, academic editing at all, uh, except maybe a couple of uh, projects. Uh, though I've done a little bit of nonfiction also. But coming to your question of uh, what do I find most difficult is um, the fact that a lot of authors have amazingly good stories in them, but the language is sadly lacking because again english not being their first language they have have not learned it properly so when they write um, as somebody suggested there are times when there are a lot of rewrites involved because it generally becomes the translation of what they are saying in their regional language or they are talking in uh, they are saying in hindi and they just write the same thing they convert it into you know, english however possible so that's a tough thing that i face usually Thank you. Thank you, Interpri. Thank you, Tanvi. Thank you. Yes, sure. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Would anyone like to ask anything? Yeah, I would like to say something. I mean, it, it's sure. more, yeah. So uh, with respect to Mr. Robert Lash's uh, uh, presentation, uh, we would like to talk to her, right? Um, see, uh, one thing I could understand that uh, we have been perceiving Indian English mostly in comparison to uh, the kind of the variants of English spoken, uh, you know, overseas like American English or British English or Australian, even Australian English for that matter. But, uh, you know, to make English, Indian English more rich, I mean, richer, uh, there needs to be an internal, uh, a domestic churning as well, right? I mean, you know, uh, there are 28 states and, and probably over 200 languages that, you know, we speak, even though, I mean, also considering dialects not the mainstream, not the official uh, widely spoken Indian languages, but also the dialects that come with it. So what can we do to churn uh, the usage? I mean, churn the, the, the chunks of language, their own language that come into our mainstream Indian English. I mean, is there a proper way to churn it out? Is there a proper way to, uh, you know, um, uh, enrich that vocabulary, our Indian English vocabulary to, uh, that come from our Indian languages? Oh. I, am I making myself clear for, first of all? I don't know what the word churn means. Churn as in, I mean, see, uh, there are so many English languages, like so many Indian languages and these, I mean, the, the, the words that we use in Indian English, the words that we now recognize as part of Indian English, how do we bring them out? Because there are so many Indian languages, it is it becomes easy for us to compare uh, uh, Indian language with I mean, Indian English with the English spoken in other countries. Yeah, yeah. But from within our country, within our own country, how is it, how can we easily bring out such slang, such colloquial usage of English that we can make a part, make it a part of our Indian English vocabulary? Is there an is there a better way of doing it? Is there is there a proper way of doing it? The thing is, most European languages have have um, a bureaucracy, mm. like the, the French have, a, and the Germans and the Spanish have institutes that govern the language, and the German-speaking countries meet once a year to decide what's acceptable in the standard language. Mm -hmm. That's something we do in South Asia. We just don't do dictionaries and thesaurus and, and govern languages. I think I think um, to help with this, if you don't mind, Robert, me just jumping in. Um, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do, right? Like the idea that we should build a corpora, we should have a dictionary, we should have a style guide. Those sorts of things will help standardize what's acceptable, what's not, what's not acceptable, and also help us distinguish between written English and spoken English, because there are 
you know, there are just so many variants of English, academic yeah. fiction, legal English, and, you know, everyday fiction, like fiction writing. I mean, fiction writing has its own needs. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot more creative license there, um, which, you know, would not be acceptable, let's say, in, in legal English, right? So um, I, I think, which is exactly what we're saying is like, we need standardization, we need some kind of documentation. Um, someone who was attending, I don't know if she's still on here, from Australia, someone called Kim, I think, uh, who I was chatting with um, earlier, um, you know, she was saying, oh, Oh, it's been you know in, in Australia it's been so good to have the Macquarie English Dictionary and they do and they have a style guide of their own which is quite thick just like you know the, a, the a, APA or the AMA or whatever the hell it is and um, they also have this really uh, vibrant society of editors which I used to be part of I used to live in Australia I lived there for 10 years so I was part of all this I was trained in Australia as an editor so I understand exactly what you're saying and I realized at that point actually when we were having that discussion I said Hmm, how interesting. It made me think that Australian English was really real, even though we were only 20 million people. Whereas mm. honestly, that's the population of Bombay. Mm. You know, <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about it. Like we're, we're much more, we're, we're many more, uh, but we never get taken seriously, partly because we just have no standardization. There's no body, there's no governance. There's no, there's not someone saying this is right. This is not right. You know, the moment you have that, uh, where it's, um, uh, not legal, but it's uh, formalized, um, then I think it takes on a, a more weight. Uh, uh, mm. Can I just add something to this, Sanvi? That uh, the example of, you know, the uh, the phrase half-girlfriend that was mentioned earlier uh, by Smriti, it was exactly uh, what we're talking about. Unless and until it becomes uh, forced uh, on its own or it, it goes viral, so to speak, uh, you know, the word or the usage is not accepted. So if we have a, a, a formal thing, that, that'll be easy, not just for academic, but for fiction writers also, because uh, uh, there are times when people take so much of liberty that it is fiction, we can just write anything. Uh, it it causes uh, that is the reason why people then uh, look down upon Indian fiction and say they are not good enough. Uh, okay, if can I, I can, may, I, uh, I, can add. I add more to it? My, like, can I complete my uh, observation? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. What I said, why I said that was uh, the point when because of certain words that are used in Tamil. So we were talking about Tamilish, right? So it has become a part of the common vocabulary to use the word macha or machi, right? So what today, that, can you explain what that means to us non tamil Okay, uh, so in, in uh, this is uh, the uh, Hindi, uh, sorry, Tamil equivalent of the Hindi word sala. Like the sala, the way we use it to address our friends, usually in, in common parlance. So macha and machi is is the way is the way we address our friends, okay, our our peers. So uh, that becomes a part. I mean, that would eventually become part of an uh, uh, of the Indian uh, English vocab because it has come with us. It has been used in fiction. It has been used in films. So that could cons be considered as part of our lingo. But I mean, our, how can we bring more such words? How can we bring more such usages from various corners of the country so that we can make a more consolidated, as Ms. Indapreet said, a more formal, uh, you know, collection, uh, a more formal uh, place where, uh, from where we can use it in our form, uh, like our literature or our... Uh, creations indian english creations i i think uh, i think what you're asking is how do we reach out to people to yes. bring other yes. languages yes. Yes. it's honestly it's just you know at this point it's we're talking word of mouth right i mean how does anything ever get known how do people know that there is an association that exists there how do people know that people are working on an indian english dictionary it's one of those things right Hopefully, yes, we can we can achieve this by maybe putting together a website at some point once we have people who are dedicated to doing this work. You know, all of this is unpaid work. So this takes time. We all know what volunteer work is like, right? Like Vivek and Murugraj are like <laughs> amazing, phenomenal. Yeah. Right? Hats off. You guys do so much work. It's Definitely. just uh, it's just fantastic. Um, so can we have other people like that? You know, uh, do we have other people with that kind of energy who could put time and effort into creating something? something like this, because eventually these things are not paid. So how, do, how, how, how will we get people from the Northeast involved in this? How will we get people from Ludhiana involved in this? I don't know, it's word of mouth. You know, eventually it's like, if you hear about it, you can add to it. Hopefully with Robert's corpora, um, you know, we can start looking at texts from different parts of the country and people can keep adding to that. Uh, so that would be, hopefully that will work towards that. Here, if I may interrupt, um, I think we also need people who are, um, you know, language experts who recognize these words that can be, you know, brought into another language. 
So there is a lot of work, as you said, Tanvi. Um, you know, it re really requires a bit of expertise also. It's not just bringing in any word. It's bringing in words that will be useful, that make sense, and that are really, you know, um, Indianisms that have to be brought in here. Yeah, which not is part of in... why, which is part of what I'd said in that, you know, we should reach out to other English language associations in India so that, you know, because we're editors, we're not like, we're not linguists, we're not lexicographers, we're not, we don't have those skills. And we, and you know, if we do, then that's great, but most of us don't. And to create a dictionary, that's exactly what you need. And we don't have that capability, but we have, we have the drive. And you know, if we have the drive, if we have the drive, then we can combine hands with other, with other groups and see what can be done next. I mean, so this is a slow process. It's not gonna be something we start tomorrow. Um, but if the seed is planted, and that was really the point of this session, is that if the seed is planted and we start thinking about these things and, and, and um, you know, people come forward and say, hey, I'd like to do some work on this. So I'm really interested in this is a cause I can really put time towards. Then that's great. We can take it forward. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions or comments or anything else? Otherwise, I think we can. Tanvi? Yeah. Hi, Tanvi. This is Venkitesh again. Yeah, hi, Venkitesh. Well, I, have a, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, when you receive any material, uh, I think you are able to discern that it's it's Indian English. So can you tell us like what are the common characteristics that make you decide it's Indian English? If you can, like. Okay, Venkatesh, to be perfectly honest, I actually don't work with um, any Indian authors. Um, all my clients are, because I work uh, you know, with authors, um, academic authors, uh, all my clients are non-Indian. It just so happens. Um, partly because I charge international fees and those are not usually affordable by Indian authors. Part of it is that. Part of it is that client base has just never come through. Um, so, but okay, but to answer your question in terms of how do we recognize features of Indian English, um, I would actually suggest if anyone can get their hands on this, uh, hold on, this book, I'm going to share it one second. So this book here, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is, it's called the Indian, it's called the, in, the English language in India, the Indianization of English, the English language in India by Braj Kachu. And so that's one of the books I was referring to uh, in creating this presentation. And there is sort of towards the beginning itself, um, a chapter where he does delineate, um, he has several sort of subsections subsection, and subsections about um, how he can categorize, how one can categorize uh, these different um, sort of Indianisms, right? The Indian ways of expressing. Um, so I think this is a great book. He's, he's a very well-known linguist. Um, so if you can get your hands on it, I don't know how you would. It, apparently it's not available on, uh, online, but yes. So if you like, I can screenshot some bits for you and send it to you. <laughs> I, can't, I can't actually answer that in detail right now. Oh, thank you, Tanvi. I'll try to get a get hold of that book if possible, or okay. else uh, helping you. Okay, sure. Okay, I think we can take sort of one last question. It has gotten really long. I, I was hoping it wouldn't be so long on a Sunday. I want to make a comment, if not yeah. a question. Sure. Uh, I respect very much the commitment of all the participants and all the members that attended today. And see, I might be the oldest member. And uh, I want to tell you that this is such a strong step that we need to take together. And I have done glossaries of books that have been written in, uh, say, Assamese, like Ahomya language or Tamil language. And then when making those uh, simple things, there was a phrase called uh, innocent um, mother's virgin boy. And I argued with the translator that you didn't have to say virgin boy, innocent mother's boy would indicate virgin, but it had some meaning in Tamil, it seems, because she insisted. So we have to understand the idiom. And when we make the glossary for each book that we uh, edit, that is a translation from an Indian language, we are doing the baby steps of creating this corpus that we need to make. Thank you very much and bless you all. I am thrilled with you. Okay, thank you so much, Denise. That was a, I think that's a great place to end. Um, if there are any more questions, 
where can we direct people to Vivek? That's another reason for having a website. Uh, sorry, Robert, go ahead. Uh, it's another reason for having a website. We, we haven't got a central um, discussion forum for this for this particular topic. I, I yes, I think that's absolutely true. We need a place apart from the ICF forum that you've set up, Vivek. I think a website where um, also and also if anybody here is interested in taking this forward in a more formal fashion in the way we've been describing, please get in touch with me or Robert or any one of us who's on the panel and. Um, and so we can take it further. We're all, I think we're all available on LinkedIn or at least on the ICF forum. Uh, so yeah, look us up and, and get in touch. We, we do definitely need committees to take this forward. Can we create a separate page for this on uh, Facebook and get everybody, uh, you know, those who are interested could join that and work on this together. So that way it would be easier for us to keep in touch. Sure, that's a good idea, Veena. Um, Again, I have to consult with Vivek since he's the one managing all this. Um, and if you can, if you can help help me set this up, um, Vivek. Yes, Tanvi. What say um, you? <laughs> yeah. Before we end, I would like to have a comment from Sara. Like she is from Australia, and she has been with us for the entire session. Sara, so any comments before we close? You will have to unmute Hi, yourself. everyone. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here today. It's my first event with um, the Indian Copy Editors Forum, and um, I was happy to see some of my Aussie colleagues here as well. I did invite some of my Japanese colleagues as well, but maybe the timing was a bit difficult, but I'm hoping that a lot of them will be um, viewing the recording because I've had some inquiries about when, when and where the recording will be available. Um, I don't know. I don't know I, I, I learned so much. Ah, <laughs> 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 um, So I work with both Japanese and English. I work as a translator as well as an, an academic editor for English. But um, I just found every session fasc fascinating, and I learned so much. I'm I'm embarrassed to say I don't know much about Indian English yet, but I. This session has really uh, inspired me to read a lot more widely than I have. Um, I think the problem is, you know, I don't know if you all feel the same, but as editors and or as translators as well, we spend so much of our time reading for work <laughs> that I find that ever since I became a full time professional, I read so much less for pleasure. Um, <laughs> And I'm hoping now that, you know, uh, now I'm in my 40s, I, I can actually uh, put down a little bit and, and start reading more. And Indian um, writers are top of my list now. So I'm looking forward to receiving all the links. I didn't have time to write down most of the um, recommendations. But um, thank you very much. And We will share the chat maybe and we will certainly be sharing the presentations. And delighted with your idea to share LinkedIn. Sorry to interrupt. I'm really delighted with your idea to share LinkedIn um, uh, uh, links um, in the chat because, you know, running um, events like this for, for the Aussie organization as well, I never thought about that. And it's just a wonderful way to promote networking. So thank you so much for that, Vivek. Well, I won't take credit for that idea. I was attending a Be a Better Freelancer conference that's going on, it's, it's online. So they were doing that. So I thought it was a good way to network in the chat box. And uh, we will upload the recording for today's session as soon as possible. It will be available on our YouTube channel. And there you can see the recordings for our previous sessions also. And we are now having sessions every Saturday at 4 p.m. and every Sunday at 11. So please feel free to attend. We would be happy not to restrict these sessions only to Indian editors, but to editors all over the world. Well, I'd be delighted to help you promote them through, um, through my Australian, New Zealand, and Japanese networks. It's incredible. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, you know, thanks, Sarah. Experiences. And before, yeah, before I end, a very big thanks to all the speakers and to the 
moderator and the keynote speaker tanvi i know how much preparation has gone into this we had three zoom calls before the actual event today and there is a long chain of emails and whatsapp messages and there is a lot of more work that is to be done like today also i wanted to have a lexicographer on board i couldn't i wanted a gentleman who has written a book on indian english but i couldn't get him so maybe we will have some session sometime later when we have done some work on the idea that robert is working on and that will be a follow up kind of session great that sounds really good vivek who is this who is this person who's written the book uh, it's mr gopal sharma he is an icf member so currently the book is with the publisher so let, let's hope the book is out before we have the follow up session okay great thank you very much everyone for coming i think we can end here yeah thanks everyone thank